Hi guys, this is G from The Idea. We hosted a very successful webinar last week and people who missed it have been messaging us and the chamber for the video to be uploaded. So here it is. It's a lot shorter than the actual webinar because there's no Q&A and a lot less banter and polls. So without further ado, let's begin with setting the context. So this is not a get rich quick video. It's to talk about surviving during a crisis and then thriving. So scaling and things like that are in another series of webinars and content okay and our approach is about contribution over passion meaning that we're talking about giving back and staying relevant resonating with our consumers uh through solving their problems as opposed to a passion-based one which is similar basically similar to what that steve jobs commemoration speech at harvard was about what you got to follow your passions the problem with that is that if everybody did this we wouldn't have any cleaners we wouldn't have anybody doing jobs which nobody would want to do okay so that's actually not very good career advice so the approach here is compassion over passion that <clears throat> we're going to focus on serving people as opposed to a me-centered thing over how i'm going to fix my problem sell my product it's more about how am i how can i solve a problem for the community or for my customers okay so it's a we not me approach all right, so that's what today is about and to give you an example of how interconnected we are so that's me up in the top right corner at one of our festivals so we run the biggest festivals in cambodia and the first thing that we tell our vendors is that we are successful when you are successful and that is so true because if the vendors were selling selling boring products you know they didn't do anything interesting and the food festival would have therefore nothing interesting i would get nobody there and likewise if these businesses closed we wouldn't have a food festival right so we're so interconnected and down below is the trampoline park that i co-founded and same thing with smes if if they're not doing well or if the community is not doing well there's no salaries being paid i would have no birthday parties at the trampoline park if the companies were shut then i wouldn't have anybody doing team building right so it's the same thing with a lot of many other types of businesses is that they're all we're also reliant on each other Okay, and if you can solve a problem for the much wider community, you're going to resonate with everybody. Okay, so <clears throat> to begin with, and as a consultant, I have to do my due diligence and tell you that safety definitely comes first. Uh, and is that before you talk about opening and pivoting, definitely cover your health and safety items first from COVID. That's so important. If you need the information, you can see it here, <clears throat> bottom left uh, on our website. All those resources are there. Okay, but the point of the slide was that. For you because we're talking about uh, empathy and self-compassion <clears throat> sorry compassion and it's that if you don't have the energy and the mental resources because you're not practicing empathy for yourself and there's no self-compassion you've got nothing to give so you gotta look after yourself first your family and your team before you start looking at solving issues in the community okay so safety first you first right so on that note this is today's business pivot process for the video. That's you, the SME up in the corner. We're going to journey on down through to the perspective shift uh, because you have to make sure that you get mental clarity to make the right decisions. So before we even look at cash flow and everything else, you need to be mentally ready first. Okay, so this is the flow for today. You're going to see this again later on. So we're going to start with the perspective shift. Three things. The first one, a problem solving perspective, and this is the most one of well no it is the most important is that you need to apply what we call deep empathy shallow empathy which is regular empathy is where you put yourself in someone else's shoes but the problem with that is that it's not really about how you feel in their shoes it's about how they feel in their shoes right and this is one of the biggest problems when we do when you do market research when you're asking your customers about what they what they need or or what problems they're currently facing is that business owners sometimes get very defensive right or your managers or your executive and they're not really listening so you got to stfu in this particular video means stop the feedback you so in order to practice that level of empathy to really grasp all the information that's in front of you and that person is trying to communicate to you okay is that you gotta just be there okay and what i do to get to that state of mind and physiology is that i do a deep body scan i for example look at how quickly my heart is racing because if it's racing really quick and i'm supercharged and i'm like go 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 i am not in a position to listen okay so i check first and then i breathe right so that's the first thing get into a state where you're actually truly able to empathize 
right? And understand that person's problem. The second step is to get over this fear because a lot of SME owners, and this is really important to, to touch on, is that there's so much uncertainty which leads to fear, right? And it creates a lot of, oh, I'm not sure what to do. I'm not sure if I should even move or I should just wait. The issue is that change is absolutely inevitable, all right? And not knowing what's going to happen is okay because it's going to be okay, right? Things are going to change and things are absolutely going to work out. And you have to tell yourself that, right? Because you have to pass that message on to the team. Because even if you want to change and your team is not willing and or able to do it, then it's not going to happen, right? So firstly, getting that mental clarity and remembering that, you know, change is inevitable. And that if you're watching this because of COVID-19, it's not your failure, right? So you do have to make some form of changes in order to make up for the new government regulations that are definitely going to come out now. Uh, and likewise with customer preferences, that's all going to change, right? And since it's going to change and you're going to exact that change, you might as well enjoy doing it. Smile, right? Because people prefer to be around company like that, your customers included. But if you're not at that end of the spectrum and you're still freaking out, then write down your worries, write down those uncertainties. Okay. And if it's still really, really a big issue, then get some professional help. Okay. That's very important to do. And lastly, <clears throat> put on your we, not me cap, okay? Uh, and what we mean by that is some of these SME owners, when they speak to us, it's uh, how do I sell my product more? How do I get my stuff out there? That's not the right question to be asking. It, you should be asking, how am I solving a problem or for the community right now? People have problems. And can my product in its current form fix that? Because if it can't, change it. So that it can. So a we not me approach is definitely going to get you into the right frame of mind to pivoting your product or service or brand. Okay. So that's what we got to do. Get yourself into a really nice state of mind, meditate, or, you know, go for a run, do a deep body scan before you do the next thing, which is cash. Right. And for a lot of people, this is a very sensitive topic, which is why I put a picture of a non-threatening mushroom on the left. Um, so we're talking in this particular slide about reducing expenses, okay? So, <clears throat> to, and again, this is sort of about getting your, your mental clarity on, is that if you're afraid and you're freaking out, just remember that your position is relative. If you haven't finished the negotiations, negotiations or even started them, right, or have, haven't delegated and things like that, then you haven't put yourself in the best position yet, okay? So your position is relative to what you've done, when and where you are, okay? And the second step then is to look at what you can actually reduce. And that means a lot of negotiations with suppliers, team members, your landlord. Uh, and the best way, and I would say the only way of doing this really well is applying that deep empathy. Now, I'll use my landlord as an example. So when our sales started to plummet, we went to our landlord right away and we said, we need to work it out because we can't pay rent this way. We're having a really big problem. We, we need a discount. You know, and they said, look, we'll give you 10%. And I was like, I, I don't have enough money though. Like this is sort of where I am. And I want to get to the point where I'm continually paying rent. Let's both agree on that. I, I, I I'm not trying to hurt you here, but I, I really need the support. I've my, I've lost 50% of my revenue, not even profit. <clears throat> and that's all they wanted to give. So what we did was went back to the drawing board. We think maybe we're not being empathetic enough, which I realized we weren't. And we realized that for the landlord, a lot of their problems were the same as, as ours. Their revenue was coming down. Tenants were going asking for discounts. Their empty spaces were not going to be rented out for months. Right. And so then, and this is where the tactical empathy comes in. We realized, Hey, other landlords are facing the same issue. So we went to like five other places negotiated and we basically were able to get rental at other locations for bigger spaces for half of what we were getting and with no bond because they really needed the cash right so we had a lot more negotiating power now because we applied that empathy and realized what the big problems were and realized that there were opportunities waiting there for us so we went back to the landlord right still being compassionate and said hey look we're getting much better offers and I don't look, I don't want to hurt you. Like we've had, we've got a really good relationship going. I want to support you. And I know you want to support me so I can continue paying rent. Right. So what can you do for me now? Because I have this other offer in the end, they gave us an 80% discount. Right. So that worked really, really well for us. So remember to apply deep empathy and compassion beforehand. And as you're doing negotiating and remember to actually communicate that person's needs 
paraphrase them even if you have to, because they need to know that you know their needs. Okay. Right. And then on another note for the third one is in crisis mode, if you absolutely have to fire staff, I wish that you don't. But if you have to, there's two types of people that you really need. A rainmaker, someone who brings in all the customers and then the operator or technician, someone who is creating the actual product. Those are two people that you absolutely need to keep. OK, uh, moving on now, by the way, if you have any questions about what you could do here, let us know in the comments and we maybe no, we could actually create another video for you. So today's video was really in this section here about the, the pivot. And these are seven steps that you got to follow. OK, you identify the problem, uh, clarify what it is, create a whole bunch of solutions to trial. And then you partner up with someone, trial it, try and sell it fix whatever issues you have, and then go to market with what we call a sales-ready product, okay? Now, there are three types of pivots that you can actually do. Today, we're going to cover a product pivot, okay? But a product pivot is where you differentiate your product to sell to the same customers or sell to new customers. You can do a customer pivot where you have the same product, but you change the messaging to sell to somebody else, or a brand messaging pivot where you shift the tone for your whole company so, for example, you did no CSR before, which you should, and now you're saying, hey, look, we're a very community-centered, community-first business, you know, and and this is, these, this is what we're doing in the community. This is what we're doing to solve issues. And that will resonate with a whole other group of people, right? So those are the three different ways you could do it. But today we're going to cover a product pivot. And the example is this bakery here called Pelican, which is run by a totally beautiful, smart, amazing, and caring owner who happens to be my wife? Not that lady that is not my wife. Cool. So problem identification, there are three things that you could do. Okay. And the first two steps are really simple. Call existing customers, ask them what their problems are. Very simple. And then remember to STFU, stop the feedback and be completely present and empathetic. Right. Uh, and a lookalike. So that first one, I think, is fairly simple and self-explanatory. The second one is what we call a lookalike audience, which is borrowed from Facebook, um, where these are people who have the similar or the same interests and behaviors as your existing customers, but they're not currently your customers. And the easiest way to frame it is that they're like the friends of your existing customers. How do you reach them? Through your existing customers. Right. And remember to be empathetic and be compassionate and be sincere and genuine when speaking to people. So what I did, for example, uh, was was I would call John, for example, and say, hey, man, look, I I'm in a bit of a pickle. I would love just 15 minutes of your time. I'm happy to check in a cookie for this time, too. But I, I need to know what else I could do with my offers to to solve some of the problems that we, our customers have so I can service them better. Or I can do something for the community, but I would love 15 minutes just to pick your brain a little bit about it. Um, and if you have a friend who's not a customer of ours, I'd love to speak to them too. You know, and, and that will be doing me an absolutely huge favor. So being very sincere, knowing when to pause, and that's something that you can use, that little script there. Anyway, so what you would get from your massive brainstorm is something that on the right here is what you call like a cluster mind map of where you start to... Uh, group the different suggestions that have come from your your uh, interviews with your customers and their lookalike audiences. Um, so, for example, for the bakery, they would have a series of products which people said, I would really love this and you're not doing this. Or these are things you got to fix and they suck and you need to improve them. And you group it all together and then you're like, okay, which is going to have the most impact for us with the least amount of investment? Okay, so you start to group everything and then you proceed with the solutions afterwards. But in this step, you're just mind mapping everything and making sure you're putting everything on paper, right? Now, those are the first two steps. And the big problem with that is that customers and people don't always know what they want, right? So you're going to get an answer that is still relatively within the box. And I think it was Henry Ford that was asked why he didn't ask his customers what they wanted. And he said that if he did, they would suggest that they would want faster horses, right? And and that's really interesting because, as you know, he's you know one of the modern fathers uh, fathers of modern management created the the giant behemoth, which is General Motors. Uh, Ford, sorry. So anyway, 
Anyway, on that note, uh, what we're going to focus on is actually shredding your existing value chain. This is where we're going to come up with really, really interesting new things, right? So in this example, we're using the value chain of, of a cookie, okay? And it could start earlier. So here it starts with procuring ingredients. But you could start before that, you know, the recipe stage, R&D stage or whatever. And it can end way after this at the feedback stage or 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 anything so in this situation uh, you should know your process because you're running your company you write it all down and then the biggest thing that you're gonna do here is a what if exercise okay so what if we stopped at step two for example all right so for example okay so procuring ingredients once you've mixed your ingredients you've got your dough and what if we stopped here we would have cookie dough is that a product absolutely Subway does it. Subway, one of the world's biggest franchises, sells cookie dough at their chains. So you can go in there. It's not on the menu, but you can ask for the cookie dough and they'll sell it to you. Right? And they make that readily available. Okay? So that's one product that you can create from there already. Right? And it will appeal to a whole new set of people that love the idea of going into the kitchen. And you know how you scrape your finger along the, dough, uh, the, the bowl and you eat the cookie dough. And people want to eat this. Right? So... That's one product that's there already, which seems a lot more personal than a finished cookie in a box, right? Another example, let's say that we don't cool it, all right? Step six, we sell it super hot, okay? So one thing that you could do there is say, how are we going to sell super hot cookies? Well, that's really appealing to people because it means it's super fresh. So communicate your cookie baking time to say, hey, guys, 3 p.m. on a Wednesday, we can guarantee you this is the freshest cookie you're going to find not just in town, but in the world at 3 p.m. in Phnom Penh at that time, just out of the oven, right? So here's a, here's a campaign idea. Describe how a picture of this cookie smells, and we'll send a basket to your door from that 3 p.m. batch. Or if you turn up for pickup, because maybe you're on lockdown and you can't, like, open your dine-in, okay? But you can sell cookies that way, and people might be waiting to eat a super fresh cookie from you, right? It's a whole campaign that you can run from that. Or step seven, you say, hey, let's not package anything, okay? So that's great because it's, I mean, you save cost on packaging. Secondly, if there's plastic in it, that appeals to a whole other group of people. Um, but one campaign that you could do, for example, is, hey, uh, come pick up 10 of our freshest cookies with your own box, because we're not going to package it, and we'll throw in a sweet carton of chocolate milk for you to chase it down with, right? So plenty of ideas that come up just from your existing things. And the beauty of what I'm trying to teach you today is that it's within what you already know, right? So you don't have to invest in doing a whole other thing. This is all within your territory, your investment, your time, right? Your equipment that's already there, okay? So this value chain thing is um, shredding your value chain and asking what if, what if, what if. Right, is one of the biggest exercises that you can do to pivot the product and service. Okay, so if there's anything that you remember, remember this. Okay, right. So after this step, you got to clarify. So what we did for Pelican anyway was we didn't focus on this one because th this is going to come out later. But we were looking at a problem to solve for the community. We actually wanted to solve issues, for example, for parents who are working remotely. While managing, teaching their kids from home, they're running out of patience, time, money, worrying about the current situation. And this step here is to really, really clarify what the problem is. So you want to get to a sentence which is like less than 25 words, okay? And get to a point where you can really understand what the fundamental problem really, really is, okay? So you, when you reiterate that, the other example here is that parents are running low on time. So much more clear in five words, right? Energy, emotional tolerance due to working remotely whilst homeschooling children. They need solutions to relieve their pressure. But in that first five words, you already see, ah, oh, that's their problem. How can I do it? How, what can I do as a bakery, right, to solve this problem? So one of the solutions that came up was a kid's catering kit, right, where kids could decorate and create their own sandwiches. So lunch is made, the kids made it, they could decorate it, and you could do an online competition for the kids where they could win, like, we, we checked in trampoline park tickets. Uh, for kids to um, decorate their sandwiches, right? So first, you got to write down your concepts, okay? And you got to kill it. And what we mean by killing your darlings, it's a quote from Ernest Hemingway. And basically what it means is that your first draft is not perfect, right? Maybe your fourth or fifth selection, uh, solution is the one which will actually work, okay? 
and you got to model it for profit after that. So once you've got your solution there, uh, you got to make sure they can actually make money. So sometimes we have to remind people to do that. Uh, and then the next step is what you call a red team, blue team. So now you got to shred all your solutions to bits. So you have someone whose only job is to debate, 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 and say, hey, look, I don't think it's a great idea because. And your job, remember, to stop giving feedback and just listen, is to come up with solutions for all those objections. So you're on the blue team. Okay. And then lastly, and this is where you apply a shoot, a load, sorry, I didn't want to swear, a lot of empathy. Uh, is you think, how can I make the day better for your uh, customers, right, or their end users, okay? So in this instance, if they get the kid's catering kit, maybe there's a personalized note for the parent which says, hey, we completely get it, all right? We absolutely understand where you are. So we checked in this extra cookie just for you, right? So making their day better, and they think, wow, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for this. Okay, so anyway, so for that solution stage, remember to write it down, kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it create a whole bunch of different solutions and run it through other people until you get to something which makes more sense, right? So even in the production phase, when we were creating different artworks, in the end, this one was the one that people kind of liked. I don't personally like it, but it resonated with parents. So there you have it. Now, after you have a solution, take it to partners to see how you can save money on execution, right? The first thing is a filter, all right? Which means who shares my values and if your partner does not share your values, don't do it with them because it's not going to work out well. Okay. Um, and then this is a series of questions that you can I use to identify a really good partner. Right. So who else could need your help or uh, use the solution with uh, with you, you know, that they can sell to their customers. And that's sort of that last question there. Who has access to my new market? Right. So someone complimentary, someone who does something that you're not good at. So in this particular situation with the, the kids catering kit. The bakery is partnering up with a school, right? So they don't compete with each other, but the school is not a bakery and the bakery is not an educator. So the school is creating these food science tips and ideas to teach children about food science. And the bakery just makes the kits, right? So it's a real good win-win. And the school, because everyone's in lockdown, needed to keep relevant with the parents. So this was like a really great way of doing that. And so what they did was that they offered a discount on the kids catering kit just for those school parents. Okay, so they said, oh, wow, the school's still negotiating with the community on our behalf, right? So that worked out really, really well. Well, actually, in the end, it didn't even become sandwiches. It became pizzas because sandwiches weren't sexy enough, right? And the other thing was that sandwiches still needed sharp, stabby things to cut with, <laughs> cutting cucumbers and stuff, whereas pizzas, everything was relatively prepped and they could just decorate it. Um, so when we actually tried selling it, it didn't sell. And so we moved it to pizzas, documented, recorded everything. Uh, and on that note, we kept fixing it. So in your trial, you actually need to, this is the point, you actually got to try and sell it. And maybe, and sell it to a few people, like five or 10 customers to get that good feedback. And then once you're doing that, fix it. And the first thing that you got to do is to reintegrate it into your processes. And the biggest failure that we see in businesses is the lack of internal communication. So you might be good with change, but your team might not be. So you're going to constantly be communicating with them again and again and again. Right? And remember your costing. And here's the second big failure is that turnaround sometimes is not fast enough. So if you get feedback on Wednesday, see if you can turn it around on Wednesday. Right? If not Thursday, Friday. But Wednesday next week might be a bit too late. Right? But it does depend on what your product or your business actually does. But remember to try and turn around it around as fast as you can. Now, all that is like a giant sprint to get you to this point, which is like a sales ready product. And when you have a sales ready product, you as the SME owner, assuming you're not the technician, okay, can work on the business and not in the business. And what it looks like is a series of processes, FAQs, you know, and, and what I'm showing you this example from one of our actual businesses where from the first touch, when the customer, in that occurrence where customer sees the campaign, we know exactly who does what and when and by when and who's supervising it. So it's, and then what happens next, right? So it's really clear what's happening in this whole process with this new product. Okay, so we've pivoted. Now we actually have to maintain it and run it. All right, and that part is key. So in your mind, is it sales ready? Sales ready meaning the moment that the customers see it and they inquire and I want to make that sale, am I ready? That's pretty much what it means. Okay, and you want to reduce that sales cycle as much as possible. So if it takes you 180 days, for example, to actually close a deal, you want to get to a point where it's like 30 days. 
Right? You might not get there, but you're going to try. Okay, and to do that, you got to create all these processes and systems in place so that you can actually do that. So what we've done is we've covered the perspective shift, cash flow, the product, service, and pivot. If that's all you were here for, you can stop, right? Because now I'm going to go into going to market and operating. So cash flow and finance is essentially the same, but if you have any questions, you can ask us in another video. So going to market is to sell, right? So you're communicating, you're marketing. And you can find this on our website. We've created a filter here that you ask yourself before doing any marketing communications. And I explain and teach you how to use it on our website. So you can just jump on that. I'm not going to cover in this video. I think it's pretty well explained enough in the blog. Uh, and if you're still confused and you want to run us through uh, some of your ideas, you can put it into the comments or message us directly. We are happy to help. Okay. Especially if you're in Cambodia. Right? If you're in Cambodia, that's even better because we are focusing a lot of our attention on some of those SMEs over there at the moment to help the beneficiaries that we have. Okay, so the next one is to operate. So you're communicating now and you want to get some sales. You want to um, make sure that your business is a machine. Okay, so what we mean by communicate is to internally communicate uh, and ensure that quality is, uh, sorry, the quality assurance aspect is actually happening. So in our experience, you're spending about 10% to 15% of your time on finances and accounting, all right? And then you're left with about 80, 90% of your time. Half of that is for selling, and the other half is in operating, roughly. And it does depend on your role in the business, okay? Uh, and this is where you make sure that you're constantly communicating internally, you're delegating, 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 and you're checking that the product is actually what it should be, if not better. Cool. Now, that covers the, the core content of the webinar that we actually hosted last week. Uh, we're not doing obviously a Q&A for this, but you can ask the questions down in the video or in the, in the comments below. Uh, and what I will leave you with is a short little story of our crisis. COVID wasn't even so bad for us. Back in 2018 and 19, I unfortunately invited a partner to join the business and I'd raised all these funds just beforehand. And in the end, I lost everything and at the sort of towards the tail end of it we had two weeks of cash left and we lost a lot of clients because uh there was a lot of fraud embezzlement you name it all kinds of stuff going around and that was a really really hard time for us and what we did was personally because i actually wasn't in the country right and when i came back and then i found out what was going on that the money was all missing and I reached out to all my clients' partners directly, and they were like, oh, you're back, great, but what's been going on, and all these sort of things. And then I told them, and I just was so genuine and sincere about where I was. They said, look, we're here for you. You've always helped us out. It's our turn to help you now. And they were really very much there for me in that time of crisis. So firstly, there was trust and, and attention that I carried with them already. So that, that was in my favor. Um, but then my approach with them was I looked, even though it's a sad stop story for me, I still want to help you and I still want to get through this and I still want to be relevant and I still want to help the community, right? And they love that. They love that part about me. And so what we did was we turned this into an opportunity where we ended up celebrating our fifth anniversary. Uh, we sent these cool little, and this is where the whole, um, how can you make someone's day better question gets answered. So what we did was send out cheesecake invitations asking for a slice of your time to all these VIPs and clients and they got this. They loved it, right? So we sent it to wherever they were in the day, these surprise invitations that were cheesecakes. And this was their genuine reactions. They posted that on, like, Facebook and things. And and that, that meant a lot to me because other people saw it. They were like, oh, what's this really creative company doing? That's fantastic. Uh, and in the end, we pivoted so well. We had better cash flow, a stronger team, and a better model after this, right? So for me, it was very much about managing my, my energy. I had to look after myself, practice self-compassion. And this is where the we, not me thing comes around full circle, right? So if you really need help and you're really helping people and being very genuine, people will be there for you, okay? So that would conclude the end. This is basically the end of the video. If you have anything that you want to ask, you feel free to message us on our Facebook, uh, the Idea Consultants, on our website, as you can see uh in the links below uh and yeah feel free to ask we're definitely here for you we're happy to help the community so let us know bye bye and best of luck